John, thank you very much for agreeing to come here and uh, have this conversation uh, for the first session after the opening of what I think will be a brilliant day for the U.S.-India Conference for All India Management Association. Well, this is my favorite topic in the world, as though if you, those of you who know me, I believe the most strategic relationship in the world between any two countries is between India and the U.S. And so to say this is my favorite topic would be an understatement. I actually just said that in the beginning when I opened that we've had a love-hate relationship for many years, but in the last 20 years or so, we've actually realized that these two countries are more alike than any other. Yes. Literally. There yes. are no two other countries on this planet which are more similar, and there's no reason why we should not be doing more together. Completely agree. So, um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, what I thought we would do is, while I have this conversation with John, I'd, I'll talk a little bit about him, ask him a few questions, and then we will open it up to the audience uh, for your questions and comments. And we will try and close this. We have an hour, right? Who's, who's minding the time here? An hour? OK, so just give us, just give us a, a heads up when, when we are getting close to time. So John, you, you just stand up, you go like this, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> You'll get used to my sense of humor. <laughs> so John, you've been a legend in business, industry, economy, and commerce. You built the plumbing on which the rest of the world runs this amazing digital economy. And you didn't just build it, you built this against odds in your own childhood. Uh, you were dyslexic, I, I believe. And, That's and you overcame that because mm -hmm. uh, many people believe kids who have a problem will get left behind. Mm -hmm. But you've demonstrated that it doesn't matter, that you can address any challenge in your life any problem in your life and come out ahead. It needs, obviously, it needs determination and a certain kind of spirit that you have demonstrated. So tell us a little bit about how you, you handle some of the challenges in your younger days. Well, you know, it's interesting. How many of you in the room are parents? Okay, so you know where I'm going with this. Um, everyone likes to talk about successful leaders, and it's exciting having grown a company yep. from you know, 70 million to 48 billion uh, dollars and you know, 400 people to 75,000 people, and you've done those type of numbers with your companies. But I believe you're more a product uh, as a leader of how you handled your challenges than you are your successes. And the reason I ask about you as parents, you, you're proud when your, your child scores a goal in soccer yep. or they get a good grade in school and you help them understand how they deal with success. Uh, but what you really worry about is how do they handle their setbacks, uh, either in their personal lives or others. And if you could navigate through them, their first setbacks, you would do that in a second. So I think we're more a product of how do we handle our challenges than our successes. Uh, I didn't used to talk about dyslexia because it, uh, it is hard. My hands sweat even today uh, just mm. with the mention of the word. But I found that it's so important because so many people have kids or they themselves are dyslexic. And they think if you have a challenge in life, you never have a chance to play at a different level. What I learned through spatial education, and this is before dyslexia was even understood. Mrs. Anderson, a teacher, taught me how to do it. You take a weakness, you make a strength. And once you overcome that, then you realize you can do that in any way in life. Once you overcome that, oh, I've never made fun of anybody else in life. Because once you've had a weakness where you read and other people laugh at you because you can't read, I read backwards, uh, uh, you don't make fun of other people. Uh, unless they're very good friends so, and you can tease them. So uh, but it is that learning curve. And I announced the dyslexia by mistake. I would take our children to work day. And a young girl, uh, and there were about 500 people in the room, asked a question. She couldn't get the question out. And she said, I've got a learning disability. And dyslexic, and she started to cry and left. And, and uh, it, you know, I could still get choked up about it talking today. But as she walked away, I followed her off the stage uh, and talked to her and, and said, I'm dyslexic too. And uh, I said, here's how you deal with it. Here's the way you're never going to do things seriously, but you've got to picture the big picture say what you want to ask the question on, take a crack at it. And she asked the question, 
And then all of a sudden I realized the whole room was quiet because I had a lavalier mic on and I disclosed to everybody my weakness. I don't know about that. So I, I was really worried. I, I went home I didn't saying mean went to too ask, far. I didn't mean to ask a difficult question. But no, but what it I was, was an important yeah. one to lead yeah. by example. Thank you. And so you have to Thank be willing to say that everyone has challenges in life. And yeah. so sharing yours uh, makes it more in touch, but it also is in business or in leadership how you handle the setbacks. You never have a great leader, Jack Welch taught me this, until your company's had a near-death experience. Okay. So I'm going to change gears a little bit. Okay. I'm going to make a few statements here. All right. Voice will be free. Video is the new voice. The Internet of Things will be bigger than the Internet. Market transitions wait for no one. France will become the startup nation in the world. In Europe, I'm sorry. India will be an amazing country and an economy. If you agree with everything I've said, then I've failed. By the way, these are not statements being made by John Chambers today. These were made by him over the years, many years ago, way before any of us realized that this was actually happening. So are you a futurologist, John? So no, I, uh, <laughs> in part because of that weakness about dyslexia, I've always been crowdsourcing from the very beginning. And what I do is pattern recognition. And hmm. so once I see patterns occurring, I identify the market transitions, uh, and then I'm able to play out that chess game very quickly to what the most likely outcome would be. Yeah. And then I learned early on in leadership, you've got to be able to take your concepts, which are often complex in dealing with technology, and make them easy to understand. So you can imagine explaining to the service providers in the world, whether you're in India or the US, that 90% of their business and profits was going to be free. And I, they didn't exactly like what I said, but what I was trying to do is get them to realize if they didn't move on to video, if they didn't move on to the internet, if they didn't move on to being a technology provider, not just a transport of voice, yep. they would fall behind. So uh, it's collecting that data, and in part because I'm dyslexic, I can connect the dots really quickly. So you're able to say, uh, Macron is going to win in France uh, yeah. when nobody believed that he'd even run, much yeah. less win, uh, and be able to, to see perhaps outcomes uh, around the corner. Wonderful. There's one more thing about you. You've demonstrated amazing individual capability, capacity, and values. When most CEOs were flying on planes owned by companies, even when the companies couldn't afford it, you went ahead and bought an aircraft, but, but with your own money, yourselves. And I believe you're also super careful with how you use it. So, and you turned 10,000 millionaires out of your company. So what is it that makes you think about these things as an individual with responsibility more than most of us seem to demonstrate. I came out of West Virginia, uh, and my parents, who were both doctors, trained me very early about the importance of giving back. And those that have the opportunity to get an education, mm -hmm. or those that have an opportunity for financial success, mm -hmm. I believe owe an equal obligation to give back. And it's deep in my DNA and how I believe. And I could have kept a lot more of the options at Cisco. And, and uh, instead of having 10,000 millionaires, just had 5,000. Uh, hmm. But that isn't what it's about. I believe you share success and you share the challenges. I knew every illness of every employee, their spouse or their children, that was life-threatening. And we were there for them like no one else. And I still get calls from people I helped 20 years ago that weren't supposed to live, but because we opened doors at hospitals, et cetera, or helped them through the tough times, we changed it. Now, what the correlation is, however, uh, many people get confused. Corporate social responsibility, doing the right thing is nice, but they often separate it from profits. They actually are intertwined. In every country in the world where I've been the top corporate social responsibility player, I've had number one market share and the highest profitabilities. And in today's world, and we'll talk about later, on startups, I'm focused not just on startups, and I hope that they're going to be very, very successful, and I'm setting unbelievably ambitious goals. I dream big. Uh, but I'm trying to say startups will be the job engine for the world, and don't just do it in Silicon Valley. Do it across all 50 states and make it inclusion. Do it across all 29 states and the seven territories in India. Do it across France, where nobody thought it would yep. be startup nation ever. And so I'm trying not just to do startups and be successful. I'm trying to generate jobs and remake really it inclusion. And so again, if I do my job right, uh, hopefully we'll, we'll be very successful in job creation uh, and a model for others to do the same thing. And can lead Yep. Usually the profits come automatically if Absolutely. you do it right. Yep. So uh, doing good yep. and doing well, I think, actually go hand in hand. And so, I encourage people in the room to think about that. It's also important 
in business in India, and especially now for high tech here in Silicon Valley, that tech can be for good or for bad. During the 90s and the first decade of 2000s, it was always for good. We have to get the image of technology back for good. And giving back is a huge part of it. So it, it can't be just about profits or ignoring the legitimate concerns of government or of citizens. You've got to say, how do we address the issues together uh, on it? So I'm a huge believer uh, in the combination of the two. And yeah. I'm really what I'm defining is, I think, the next generation of capitalism. You, you remind me a little bit about my dad, by the way. When we had 100,000 people in our system, he literally knew everybody and their families, each one of them. And he used to say that you can be good and do good at the same time. Yes, you can. And if you run a business that's And you saw the growth and, and you saw the profitability. Yep. Yep, uh, on the plane so. issue that he was alluding to, uh, that, however, was not one of my better decisions. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, and, uh, we were all flying coach, and it made a difference of about $2 on the price per, of the share of the stock if everybody flew coach. And if anybody wanted to upgrade, they paid for it themselves. I did not think it was fair to ask my employees to fly coach if I wasn't going to do it, and if I was going to upgrade, including having a plane, uh, that I ought to pay for it myself. And I was probably the only CEO in America who did that. Uh, and uh, it turned out nobody cared. <laughs> and so I probably should have given away the money and let the company buy the plane. Uh, but uh, it's kind of lessons learned uh, uh, making so a difference. Before we turn to India and startups, okay. I, have, I have a couple more. So. Uh, what saved Cisco from this massive dot-com bust? We went through many challenges. You were like a machine. You were acquiring companies every other day. You were building mm -hmm. this thing into some. No, nobody imagined that this company would get to where it did. Yes. So what is it that you had learned? What is it you were doing differently from the competition, differently from your friends in the industry? Yes. What allowed this thing to, to become this amazing machine? Well, we went through a, a decade of explosive growth, uh, growing at 60 to 70 percent per year for a decade. You know, and I mentioned the numbers, you know, 400 people to at that time 40,000 people. Yep. Uh, we hit our forecasts each year, plus or minus one or two percent. We were that accurate on the data capturing and extrapolating out what did it mean. Uh, and uh, we were on top of the world. We were the most valuable company in the world for a very short time period. I wish we hadn't done that, but that's a separate topic. Uh, and uh, all of a sudden, we hit the dot-com bust. And uh, we went, if you could imagine, from 70 percent growth in orders the first week in December to minus 30 percent in January. And 25% of my customers disappeared. Didn't stop ordering, disappeared forever. Uh, and it was free fall. And uh, once I saw the data in January, obviously my own information systems had failed me because it didn't signal this. And so I went out and went on a two-week tour around the world. And I came back. And on the way back, I realized that I was going to have to change the company dramatically. And I ran on the treadmill to four o'clock in the morning that night. Mm. Uh, I called up my executive team. We all got into the office by 6.30, and I said, we're going to restructure the company. We're going to take headcount down. This is a 100-year flood. Uh, our survival is based upon this. And uh, then it's classic for how you deal with a problem. You first say, was the problem largely self-inflicted, or was it market-inflicted? I felt that it was market-inflicted. By the way, the market did not agree when I announced it uh, on it. <laughs> And then, uh, then I felt that our strategy was right. We'd seen the growth, so I was not going to make dramatic changes on the strategy, but I had to structure the company differently. Mm -hmm. And then I painted the picture for what we looked like later, both for our shareholders, our customers, and others. And we made all the changes in 51 days. And on day 52, we started gaining market share again. And uh, our peers still did not think it was a problem. Right. The press was still beating us up about, you know, and how did you guys be so brilliant for a decade and now you're a bunch of idiots, uh, especially the CEO. Uh, and uh, uh, that's when leadership is lonely and you yeah. have to navigate it through yourself. Yep. But we made the changes and I'd like to say we just out executed all of our competitors. What we did is we did the market transitions better than all of our competitors. Well, that's and a wonderful we sign. We had a bunch of them. They all crashed and burned. Yep. They were, this, or this is... never came back to anywhere near their size. Uh, however, I learned. And this is important. You only want to make mistakes once. Yeah, and it, it, leaders, I expect them to take risks and make mistakes. Just don't make the same one twice. So I had done what? 
I had the best data systems in the world. I knew where my orders are by the day compared to the same day a year ago, by where it was in the month based on where it was in the quarter, by what were the trends versus new growth rates. We could hit that forecast plus or minus one or two percent for the full year like no one else, including product introductions. I'd become too dependent upon data. Hmm. I had to have my finger on the pulse of the customers and see when there was a pulse that combined a nervousness with customers with a small blip in the data to all of a sudden connect the dots and be able to say, here's the outcome. So in 2007, all of a sudden we were cruising along, 50% growth again, bigger company, everything was back to normal. And all of a sudden my top eight banks in the US all slowed their ordering down in midsummer. Now that wasn't enough. We still overachieved our quarter. We had a great growth, but it was a warning signal. And I called up all eight CEOs. They said, no, John, it's no problem. This isn't chance. So I felt there was a major problem in the US financial system. And I shared with the market that we saw a slowdown in these orders. It hadn't reflected in the rest of our business, but it slowed down these orders. Again, my stock got hit pretty hard. We then made our changes ahead of time. And by mid-2008, when we were in the Great Recession ever, we were back growing and on top again. So I learned not just to trust data, but also to combine that with touching customers and see where you go. So it's that scene around the corner, I think, in today's leadership, which is actually unfortunately accelerating. You've got to see things quicker. With social media, you don't have three weeks to respond. You've got like one hour. <laughs> and as, as United Airlines found, uh, it can be a huge problem. Yep. You've got to be able to mine the data out of social media before it occurs, as Wells Fargo found out on bogus accounts. And so learning how to communicate and, if you will, uh, recognize data patterns becomes so important in the future. So uh, while on, on speed, what are the key differences right now with the current digital age, with everything moving at this rapid pace, compared to what was happening in the 1990s oh, and, and, a great question. And, and that period, you know, when you could make a decision at leisure? Yeah. Yes. Uh, well, in the 90s, it may not have been at leisure, but it was at a dramatic faster pace than traditional business. The yeah. internet was on an acceleration kick. It was changing every company's models. Uh, we didn't sell routers and switches. I sold transformation of business, changing the way the world works, excuse me, lives, learns, and plays. Uh, however, today is three to five times faster. Yep. And this was a lesson learned from me that uh, I used to view process as bureaucracy. Hmm. And that's how most startups view it, and rightly so. And it slows you down. But I was wrong. If you do process right with innovation, with speed, then you can move with the speed that no one else does. And so I've always developed replicatable playbooks, if you will, a replicatable process that allow you to move fast. And instead of slowing you down, once you get it working well, you can move at the speed that no one else does. So at Cisco, we did 180 acquisitions. Two thirds of them were successful. We told the market that they're only gonna be two thirds successful. I still get beat up for the ones that are not, but that's <laughs> just life. Uh, it's a portfolio play. But I could get a call on a Thursday night from the head of the NASDAQ stock exchange, and he was a good friend. He said, John, you, you use your on top of your game. What are you thinking? Hmm. I said, about what topic? I've learned with anybody, you don't tell them your problems. <laughs> and uh, he said, how come you're not buying this company? I said, I don't even know what they do. He said, your competitors are in there already. They've been in there for six to 12 months. This is going to be a $3 billion deal. It fits perfectly in your strategy. And you need to go do this. And I trusted him. I called up my business development person that night. The good news was he didn't know what the company did either. <laughs> and uh, he went over there the next morning to meet with the CEO at 8 o'clock. He called me at 9. He said, John, you got to get over here. I reviewed with the CEO what the business was, where they were going. I had a handshake at lunch to buy the company for $3.2 billion. We had it through both boards of directors, public announcement Monday morning. My competitors never knew what hit them. <laughs> and it was unbelievably successful. 
but it's because we had that replicatable model of only acquiring in market transitions, only acquiring the number one or number two, only acquiring companies that have similar culture, only acquiring where you can keep the leaders and the top engineers because you're paying too much for them for their current product run rate. You've got to keep them to be able to get a faster product run rate. Uh, and because we do that so well, we move with speed that others do not. So that innovation playbook, yeah. whether it's digitizing a country like Prime Minister Modi is doing in India or like uh, President Macron is doing in France, it's that playbook that allows you to move with speed as opposed to silos that aren't connected together. So one of the most important lessons I've learned, innovation is also about an innovative process and replicatable process, whether it's acquisitions or digitizing countries or attracting the best talent. So let me come to India now, since okay. this is the US-India conference today. Yes, um, one thing has got recognized that um, there's a lot going on in India in the startup space. Mm -hmm. We are now the second or third largest startup nation in the world. Mon, is it second now? Good. It's still third. China, okay. US but China. It's, yeah. And, and 33 billion has been spent in India in recent times in over 3,000 startups. Some of them, of course, already operational. And, and uh, we had this big deal with, where Walmart spent 16 billion to acquire Flipkart uh, mm -hmm. recently. So it's getting noticed by the world. Mm -hmm. And you yourself have said there are three countries in which you would like to go in, uh, and invest in startups, in the U.S., in France, and in India. Is yes, that correct? Sir. Just three. That's correct. Mm -hmm. And uh, let me ask, rather than my telling everybody, let me ask you, why do you think India is an interesting and attractive place for looking at growth, looking at startups, and looking at a nation which will make a difference? It goes back to my my approach on pattern recognition, mm -hmm. uh, and that is my strength. I have lots yeah. of weaknesses. We don't need to go into them today. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, uh, seeing trends and market trends before it's obvious to most people is what I got lucky on in life. And coming out of West Virginia and watching the trends in West Virginia when they were on top of the world and then went to number 48 out of 50 states, mm -hmm. I'd seen that being at Wang Laboratories where they were on top of the world yeah. and then they went out of business. I'd seen that. So I'm always, you compete against market transitions, not against competitors. Uh, then you develop that replicatable pattern I talked about before, innovation playbook, for how do you, you determine what's going to happen uh, on digitization of countries or in startups. So when I look at startups, my playbook's very simple. Uh, the startups I'm going to get behind are first catching market transitions where business model and technology comes together. Second thing is a CEO that she or he really wants to be coached and knows what they know and knows what they don't, where I can really make a difference. I'm extremely aggressive on the goals. I don't invest in a startup that I think doesn't have a reasonable shot of being one or two in their industry, and I have no interest in being two. Uh, and 40% market share is my target within it. I invest in startups where uh, the customers tell me I should invest. Just like the NASDAQ told me I should buy the companies, almost every company I bought, my customers told me to buy. Uh, same thing when I invest in startups. I go to the their customers and say, what do you really think? And then I look at it. So I get a replicatable playbook. Uh, the same thing's true in countries. Uh, I invest in countries where there's a clear market transition going on. Uh, that's number one, that the citizens rebuy into. Not a few, but the citizens in total. Uh, then I bet on the leader. No surprise there. Jiang Zemin in China, 1995. Hmm. Modi in India, four years ago. Macron in France, not when he became president. But when he was economic minister, and I called my wife up, and I said, I just taught a class with him in an MBA school. Mm. I said, this guy's going to be a future president of France. <laughs> and nobody in France believed it. Mm. And uh, uh, I'm not sure it was even his dream yet. But you could see the skills. And so you invest when you see those combinations occur. And that's what's occurring in India. Now, the important takeaway here, there's no entitlement. Yep. Silicon Valley could be Boston 128. Most of you don't know what I just said. Hmm. Boston 128 was the Silicon Valley of the world just 30 years ago, 35 years ago. We yeah. didn't even know what Silicon Valley, couldn't even spell it. And today, there's not one major high-tech company left to set back a map. There used to be 1,000. So you got to earn. There's no entitlement. You either disrupt or you get disrupted. And India is disrupting. And it isn't a, a, a zero-sum game. It can raise all boats if done. The U.S., we are overconfident, boring on arrogant. Uh, we are, have a 20-year low in our startup activity. 
that with digitization and the technology being you know, done, part of them by the companies that I, I did before and part of them by new mm -hmm. ones, we're going to destroy probably 20 to 40 percent of the jobs that exist today. And if you're bringing 25 to 30 million people into the workforce over this next decade, you've got to generate probably 50 million jobs. To do that with large companies not increasing headcount, actually decreasing them because of productivity, yep. you've got to increase the number of startups by at least threefold, probably fivefold. We have no plan to do that, none, and it's scary. India, on the other hand, you are blessed with, I think, one of the top leaders in the world uh, who has the courage to outline a vision that takes risks, everything from demonetization to goods and services tax, right. uh, that truly, and I know this man very well, truly cares about every citizen in his country, which is rare. I mean, he wakes up each morning so focused on this. And he's able to outline a strategy for digitization and how it's inclusive, and he's willing to take the risk as long as he believes it's the right thing to do. He's fearless uh, on it. So that's why I bet on India. Now, why so, I bet on our two countries? We are the logical two countries to work together, and we can help each other in a way that the oldest democracy and the largest democracy uh, can, can do in the ways that we cannot. We should be the most strategic relationships in the world from our startups to our business community, et cetera. And that takes people who are willing to take risk because there are going to be setbacks along the way. And when the setbacks occur, then the critics come out and say, what were you thinking, et cetera. Uh, and I, I think our countries have to navigate through those challenges as you go forward. So the opportunities in India right now are immense. We need more health care. We need mm -hmm. more education. Mm -hmm. We need more social services. We need more manufacturing. So the, the field is wide open. And you picked you invested, your family office invested, I believe, in 16 companies mm -hmm. and uh, a couple of them in India. Two in India, so one's in. public, one will be announced right. by coming up here in October. Right. So would you like to up that number? Are there specific areas that you like to look at uh, overall? And are there some areas of in greater interest to you in India than others? Yeah, but remember my key goal. If, if all I wanted to do was to make money and to generate jobs in one location, I'd stay here in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. I can back channel every every person we recruit. Yep. I know the VCs backwards and forwards. They will give me not only the pick of the litter. I know how good they are in judging which <laughs> which horse I ought to bet on. Uh, but my goal is for it to become a startup world. And the problem, and you see it in America's voting pattern, is the middle part of America, the heartland, and the southeast are being left behind. The first time the American dream is not happening. Most parents in America know they will not be as well off as their parents were and their children will not be as well off as them. And the only way you're gonna address this is to change the startup engine and bring it across all 50 states. And uh, the only way you're gonna address 1.2 million jobs per month in India is for India to become the startup country of the world. Yep. And you have to blow past China uh, because you have a lot more people coming into the workforce. Uh, and so uh, uh, to play a role in that, with using the two examples going to five, my two to five won't make a difference in the headcount. But it can be a model working with your government leaders that I really believe in and yep. working with each of the chief ministers, regardless of political party, to say, how can we do this in every state in India and how can I be an example of how to do that? Yep. Doing the same thing in France, and I think we all understand, so France is the worst place in the world to do business. I mean, the worst. <laughs> it is. It's great to go there and have dinner, but don't get headcount there. <laughs> and in three years, it went from the worst place in Europe to do business to the best. It startups, and I'm a huge believer in numbers, as many of my colleagues are here today, went from 140 high-tech startups per year, flat line for 10 years, to 743 last year. Hmm. So let Leadership. me segue from here. Yes. You are, and you ought to be a coach. I, you are, yeah, I love being a coach, yeah, so a teacher. Because you, you, your experiences are absolutely amazing. What you've done yourselves, what you've seen happen. And mistakes so, made. Um, and mistakes made. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, incidentally, in our companies, we have a saying, we actually encourage everyone to make mistakes. There are only two conditions. You have to make new mistakes every year. Yes. And never repeat, this, repeat the same one. So, I'm going to steal yeah. your idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I agree on the second one. Yeah. Uh, I hadn't thought about pushing people to make mistakes, and I like yep. making it simple. I want you to make new mistakes each year. Yep. Makes sense? Yeah. I, I mean, that's my message to, to all the people in all the companies I'm involved with, actually. Okay. Um, so obviously your learning can, should, and actually must be condensed. So you, I yes. believe, have written a book. 
and which is yes. not yet out. So yes. what can you tell us about the book? I'm sorry I'm not giving you folks to ask a question. I just have so much stuff to ask. So, okay. so. Well, we'll, do, we'll do both. Um, yeah. I wrote the book. I thought a book should be written about once you're, once you're dead. And so I had zero interest writing a book. Dyslexia, it's hard for me to write. And uh, so I, I did not want to do it. And it's like my first acquisition. If I'd known how hard it was, I wouldn't have done my first one. But yet once you do it, you realize that I, I'm a teacher and a coach. And I wanted to share not the lessons learned looking backwards, but the lessons learned for what the future is in this new startup world. And whether that's an individual that leads a small two or three person organization, or in government, or a big company, or startups, uh, I broke it into 13 chapters that teach about how do you learn to identify market transitions, how you do an innovation playbook, how you deal with the media, how you deal with good times, but also, most important, how you handle the bad times. How do you reinvent yourself? How do you get ready for the next chapter? So it's a book that's coming out here at the end of uh, uh, this month. Uh, obviously, and you know this very well, you don't do this to make money <laughs> because it, <laughs> it, it slows you down. But it's my teaching book that I hope that people will say this is my go-to book uh, whenever I have an issue on politics or when I have an issue about how do you deal with setbacks or uh, I need to revisit a little bit, uh, am I missing a market transition? And so, you know, it's my honor. I just got these books yesterday, uh, and it's not available in general, but uh, this is my first uh, uh, book I'm sharing. It's Thank for you. you. Uh, Thank you very much. Yeah. But what I'm after yeah. on this is how do you get yeah. something that really replicates that people can learn from? And so instead of me doing the 16 go. startups, how do we do it on a much larger basis as you go forward? John, the photographer wants us to stand and get a picture with this book. Okay. If you will, for sure. a moment. Sure. There Thanks. you go. Why is the first dot blue? Uh, it's the conclusion. <laughs> so you connect you. the dots to make the prediction voice will be free. You connect the dots to say India will be the next China. You connect the dots to say France will become the startup nation in Europe. You connect the dots that if voice is going over the internet and data is primarily what went over the internet, voice is such a small load on the internet that the new challengers will give it away for free. So therefore voice will be free, business models have to change. So it's how do you connect those dots? How do you get a process for identifying uh, the pattern recognition to then jump to the conclusion and be able to do it? So the conclusion is the blue dot. Does that make sense? No. <laughs> <laughs> so think about it, okay? So hang on, just stop there. Is it blue? No, 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 hang on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, well, it, 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 you, I have fun with colors. <laughs> Blue's my favorite color. <laughs> so, so on that note, uh, questions, anybody? But please try and keep it short and have a question mark at the end of your comment, if it is a comment, okay? Yes, please. Uh, yes, um, we've met before. Yes. Um, India, uh, can you talk a little bit, uh, can you speak briefly in, in terms of India, um, your experiences for the benefit of others in terms of going into India, acquiring companies, starting companies, for both the, the positives and the cautions? Sure. So You want to take two or three together? No, it's easier for me to do okay. one if it's all right. All right. Uh, That's uh, fine. Uh, for it, uh, because I might, might confuse them. Uh, yeah. India, uh, I've always had a very positive view of India because every person I ever met from India was really smart. <laughs> and some of my friends from India said, well, John, you're only seeing our top 10%. I'm not sure I agree with that, but I've, it's been amazing. Uh, I've been on India as our second world headquarters uh, almost two decades ago yeah. at Cisco. However, I was too early. India was a great source of resources, but India was not at an inflection point to really grow and expand nor did it have the processes in place to move the nation, nor were the citizens ready for the change that needed to be done. Uh, China was what I bet on in 1995 at a time that no one else did. Uh, and uh, I got that transition right. Uh, India uh, has the youngest and best educated total workforce uh, in the world, 600,000 engineers a year. And we need to make that more inclusive. Uh, you can feel the culture changing. And then when Prime Minister Modi got elected, I got a call from the U.S.-India Business Council and said, would you be our chairman? And I said, no, uh, I don't believe in big committees like that. And then I thought, I am an idiot. Hmm. If this is going to be the transition, and this is the leader that can do it, let's try to play a small role in helping it occur. And then as I did that, I gathered the data, 
and then I saw the numbers. Mm -hmm. And then it was easy for me to go, India will be the top growth economy for the next decade. Everybody said, no way, China's going to blow away. I said, no, it won't. Just watch what happens. India will double the per capita income for their citizens every 10 years, and maybe every seven. Everybody said, no, it's not going to happen. And they're going to try to do it in an inclusive way, not just where 90% of the venture capital goes into, literally, unfortunately, six cities, uh, trying to say, how do you do this on a much broader basis? Does it have lots of risk? Oh, yeah. Chances of success, lots of bumps along the way, and there'll be setbacks, and the minute setbacks occur, all the critics will come out and say, see, I told you. Uh, but if I were betting on one country in the world right now, it's India you bet on. Pretty tough. Hang on. John, I come from a healthcare background. Mm -hmm. so You've been unbelievably successful with a number of hospitals and everything else. We're trying. <laughs> so um, what are your inputs on our recent Modi Care, which is the world's uh, largest insurance program? and promises to be. Uh, what do you think as challenges and uh, you know the opportunities for the startups and businesses? Um, there's a lot of excitement and yes. there is trepidation, so yes. your inputs would be greatly valued. In, in case yes. you're aware of or not, this is going to touch 500 million people. It's yes. a new healthcare program announced by the government of India. Yes. And popularly is being called Modi Care. Okay. And uh, it's just been, just been launched. So the first yeah. time I met with Prime Minister Modi and we talked about the uh, 11 planks that he was probably going to use for a digital India, healthcare was one of them. And he knew that he had to go in a sequence, but to keep the picture of not each of these being individuals, but how they came together in total. Because you can't do healthcare okay. without infrastructure and technology. Uh, and you can't do it without smart Perfect. cities. Uh, you can't do it without changing the education system. You can't do it without startups, as you alluded to. Uh, also, it's very important, one of the hardest things to do as a leader is, you, you, as, as a young leader, you think you have to answer, know everything. You don't. So it's important to say when you don't know a topic real well. I know the concepts here well. I think it is a very logical move to say, how do we bring this across the nation? And I think you have to solve the healthcare problem uh, in a way that Europe did not and the US did not. Uh, because with the number of people, if you don't do it differently, you will leave people behind uh, on it. And so I like the concept a lot. I'm not as familiar with the elements. If you ask me about digital India, I know that one cold. Mm -hmm. uh, if you ask me about manufacturing in India, I know that one cold startups. The healthcare one, I only know concepts on. But my initial reaction based on what I've seen is it's a very logical move. Again, there are going to be risk, and you've got to dream big. You know, if you think about it, people dream too small. And uh, the great leaders of the world, Shimon Perez, always taught me you know, uh, to dream bigger. And my regret in my time at Cisco, and I won't repeat it in my startups, I need to even dream bigger. Even though many critics would say I dream too big, took too much risk, <laughs> I go the other way. And you've got to be willing for setbacks along the way. So I like the concept a lot. I think you have to address it in mass in India. It's just too much volume if you don't do it differently. Does that yes, make sense? Then, then. Do you believe in it? Let me ask. This is the fun thing. I get to ask questions, too. Do you believe it's the right move for India? I think it's a great move for India, and uh, it will have challenges. But 10 years from today, it will 10 times more exponentially grow the access for people yep. to have access. Gotcha. The gentleman here, please. Yeah. Yeah, first of all, thank you very much, John and, and Sundar. Uh, I come from healthcare AI as well. Uh -huh. My question to you, both of you, is, India, typically in the IT sector, has been more on the services side. Now, with all the advantages of uh, promises of AI and uh, robotic process automations, that can be leapfrogged, and you don't need services as much. Where do you see India's IT will go without uh, proper product uh, companies and patent protections? Do you want to go first? Uh, so actually, now, one of the lessons yeah. learned, whenever you get a very tough question, you buy time, uh, and you buy time not just for yourself, but for your, your peer. And so what I'm doing is distracting you while he thinks about the question. And then I'm, I'm also thinking about what's my answer going to be while he's giving his. So, and so that's one of the most basic deflection techniques in a tough question environment. So it's a deal. So, <laughs> so uh, actually, first, it's a good question. Because one of our challenges in India has been we are importing most of our hardware. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not often realized that after oil imports, our second biggest import in India is electronic hardware. Mm -hmm. 
It's, and there, has been, there have been two attempts made over the last 20 years to build the hardware industry in India, or the smart manufacturing in India as well. And uh, we looked at starting from two fab facilities first. Uh, unfortunately, two and a half attempts were made. Unfortunately, none of them worked. So now there's a new initiative which says, let's not wait only for the fab to get built. It's too big, takes too long, loses too much money, and unless government subsidizes it, it's not worked in any country in the world. Uh, the Indian government, incidentally, has agreed to subsidize it, but that's still, it's a 10 to 15 year journey. They're saying, let's start at the assembly point and then move backwards. So we've started with assembling phones, for example. India is now the largest manufacturer of phone instruments in the world. Uh, there are, I forget the number now, and Mohan might know, or, or Akhil might know, the number of plants working right now, I think it's over 100? 123. 123, there you go. Uh, making, assembling phones in India. Now, what they're doing is, they started just the assembly. Now they said, okay, let's start a little bit more radio addition, then a little bit more. And uh, as you know, uh, programming and software writing was already a skill in India. So they're trying to combine the two now. So we are some distance away from where we need to be. But I think it's the right point at this for India to get start to focus on both together. So taking that uh, one step beyond, because the good news is I've seen these movies so many times. I watched IBM on top of the world when I joined them in the mid-70s and then watched them lose their leadership and they never came back. Yep. I watched Dr. Wang, smartest man I've ever met in my life to this day. Uh, invented magnetic core memory, walking across the Harvard Quad, 32,000 people when he missed the transition to the internet, lost their jobs. Uh, I've seen the transitions occur and also the trending. Uh, I think India has a chance to be a manufacturing powerhouse, but you want to go where is the manufacturing that is going to have replication in it and volume. Yep. And so building that and having the goods and services tax flattening the issue for logistics across the states was a must on the direction. You want to pick where the margins are. Manufacturing cell phones, pretty interesting. You were the largest manufacturer in the world of bicycles. Uh, uh, it's something the country, if done right, can create a lot of jobs on. But you want to pick where the margins are going to be in the growth. Uh, manufacturing, yeah. not mobile phones, uh, yeah. but manufacturing technology like routers yeah. and switches, not going to be a lot of margin there, uh, or drones. Mm -hmm. uh, so you want to go where the growth is in terms of the approach. Most of my startups are a combination of hardware and software, especially software, on it. To the second part of the question about the services industry in India, I disagree with some of the, the critics on this. Services will always be an important part of delivering solutions. However, the services have to get closer to the technology trends yes. to be able to promise of digitization uh, to gain you know, for the uh, 274,000 villages we're, we're trying to bring the internet to and the power to in India. How do you do this? And services can play a key role. I've always found that services combined with technology have higher margins in together than either one would do by themselves. So I do believe the services industry in, in India needs to reinvent itself uh, and evolve. And if you don't, you get left behind. That's true of any company. Uh, but I actually think they will come together. To the question on AI, that would be an exception. I think the government has to focus on artificial intelligence. Uh, digitization, there are lots of opportunities for what you manufacture or not. But if you watch what I think China clearly understands and the US is learning, artificial intelligence is too important part of a country's yeah. leadership to not play a role there. So I, I think it's very important India to focus on artificial intelligence and the fab plans to yeah. go with it. So India is doing some interesting stuff. We built this platform uh, called the India Stack. Mm -hmm. Completely voluntary effort, from Indians from California, Indians in India together. Uh, I believe it's the world's largest and the most efficient system built so far of its mm -hmm. kind on which you can have multiple services ride. It's an open platform and you can have payment services, you can have security, and all run in a secure environment. Mm -hmm. uh, a new one being considered now is for healthcare to, to the point that Preetha made. How do you build such a large system? You obviously need a strong foundation. So there is some of that work being done which will allow us to catapult and, and jump a few uh, stages of development in the future. We have to keep at it though. The, the, the difficult thing is you tend to lose steam when you go along these things because they don't, it doesn't happen tomorrow. Yes, uh, but I think the lesson learned, you and I grew up at a time where linear thinking worked. You do yep. it three to 5% better. Yep. You can do it over 10 years. Those days are gone forever. Yep. 
You leapfrog or you get left behind. You take the risk or you get left behind. You have to move before you have all the answers. You have to be willing to make that one mistake a year yep, yep. Uh, in each of your groups. And often society and especially the media is not prepared for that, nor are politics as you're seeing in the U.S. Uh, and so it's how do you really adjust to this new pace and how do you make it inclusive that becomes key? It's a great question. Thank you. Question. So John, so you're a man of seeing the dots and seeing trends in the future. So what is your take on blockchain and cryptocurrency? Because with India's potential, being a digital India program and the, the potential that of investment, technology, software, jobs, mm -hmm. and all so on, that has the potential of changing the way we perceive economy, markets, business, yes. etc. Yes. So two things. So two questions I have is, is that really happening the way that they projected? There's one said, you know, there's a lot of believers in this. Yes. Then they have the feds of the different countries that are vigorously rejecting and kind of, you know, putting, you know, holding that back. Yes. What's your take on that? So how fast and is it really happening yeah. the way we want it to, we expect it to Robbie, see? Thank sure. you. So this, this is another, I think, great question is it's so predictable in technology. We always get too excited too quickly. <laughs> Then about the time we give up on it, then the elbow happens. Now, there are a few mm. exceptions, but that's, that's pretty typical in terms of the trends. Um, uh, cryptocurrency and blockchain, I think, are important elements of technology, but they're not, the, they're not the foundation. I think both of them have tremendous capabilities and transformation. And uh, yeah, when you think about cryptocurrency, I think you know, what your prime minister did in a weekend, and it was full of risk. And I hope I would have had the courage if he asked me, should he have done it, for me to say yes. Uh, I didn't know he was going to do it ahead of time, although I quickly became one of the strongest outside supporters. You uh, digitized your economy in a weekend with a little bit of pain. Uh, so I think for India to be involved in both those areas is important. But I think it's more important for your total digitization effort. How do you bring this to life in digital manufacturing? How do you bring it to life in education? How do you bring it to life in healthcare? Uh, how do you bring it to life in smart cities? And you combine these not as one is the answer. They're just elements of a digital world that we live in. If there's one element, however, I would want to be really good in, it would be connecting 500 billion devices with artificial intelligence to get the right information at the right time to the right person or machine to make the right decision. That one, I do believe, will be uh, extremely, extremely uh, valuable. And this is set up for India. Okay. Today, I'm going to Sorry. one more. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. An artificial intelligence engineer in America, a really good one, might cost you a million dollars a year. Individual contributor. Hmm. And uh, you're watching the, in a startup today, when I do a startup with artificial intelligence, first question I ask is, who are your top AI people? Everybody says they are, but this is, this is where you've got to have really brilliant people. And when you find they've really got the top AI people from the right schools, that's when I bet. So it's an area that I, I think is, is important. Sorry. Okay. Uh, Akhil is uh, a heads up KPMG in India. Oh, great. Uh, John, if, if you were to give one or two pieces of advice to Prime Minister Modi from outside in view, what would be those? Suggestions, not advice. You have to be a bit careful here. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it is interesting. Your, your, your Prime Minister is, I think, one of the top three leaders in the world, one of the top three leaders I've ever met. Yep. And uh, I hold him in tremendous admiration. I think if he's given the chance to lead this country for a decade, he can accomplish things that haven't been accomplished almost since you became independent. And so uh, I, I'm a believer, and I know the challenges are going to be huge, and I know that we could fail. Uh, the suggestions or thoughts, and you always do these to where Sunil protected me there, I always make controversial suggestions behind the scenes, <laughs> and you go bait, debate back and forth. But uh, I think that the suggestions that, that he would actually agree with, as many people think he's moving too fast and India's moving too fast, I think you've got to move faster. Yeah. The other suggestion is, and this is more directed to the business people, you have to get behind a realization that there'll be mistakes made and bumps along the way, and you've got to get your country to believe in this vision. And this is where they, actually the media can play a huge role. Do you know who was the most supportive in France of the digitization of the country? It was the media. Mm. 
And I was shocked because the French media is extremely critical. But yet they grasped this could change the country. They grasped the students were ready for this. They grasped it was time for France, France to be an entrepreneur nation again. It was their word, was entrepreneurism. And they were ready to make the, the risk. So I think it's important the media unite behind this as well. You, you are absolutely right. India has done more reform in three years than in 30 years. And by the way, we've done a lot in 30 years. Yes. Yes, sir. And the young lady at the back. Yeah. Yeah, my name is Upendra, and uh, John, I have seen you many, many times. Hi. Wonderful content, always mesmerizing. Uh, Munjal Sab, you remember 40 odd years back, in a, mar in a mar marriage in India, the three things would be given to uh, the bridegroom, you know? Uh, uh, One used to a bicycle, bicycle, by the way. Yeah. Bicycle, yeah. made by Hero. Yeah. HMT watch, yeah. and Murphy radio. Mm -hmm. Correct. Uh, you remember? People yeah. from India probably remember that. Yeah. Murphy is completely out. Mm -hmm. You have invented, reinvented, and there's a huge opportunity. Electronic vehicle is another wave coming in India. From a lens of an industrialist, how do you see the growth for, inclusive growth I'm talking about? I come from a village, you know, farmer's land, right? Mm -hmm. So when the land is taken over for the development of the nation, why they are left out from the inclusive growth? Because when you take over the land, right? Okay. These Another guys question. given. Yep. Let me respond. I'm trying to get everything, yep. everything in. in well, I can take a crack. This is I actually know question. this pretty well. Go ahead. Uh, this, this is the same is question, question, question for every country in the world. Yep. Uh, the U.S. is in the exact same opportunity and challenge. If the inclusion is just Silicon Valley, Austin, Texas, and New York, we're going to have political unrest, and you're going to have have and have nots that are going to make the digital divide look small. Living. And so it has to be addressed and has to be inclusive. Uh, your leadership and your prime minister gets that. And uh, it has to be across 29 states and seven territories. And you've got to have the courage to do it. It starts with a national plan. We're the only country in the world, in the U.S., we don't have a digitization plan for our country. Your country does. Then off the plan, what are the elements that have to occur? And if you don't address them in combination, as opposed to serially, you're not going to achieve it. You have to get a startup nation across all of your states. You have to change your education system, and it's got to be much more inclusive. It can't just be your top 20% of your population getting a reasonable education. Uh, you've got to realize that if you combine smart cities with education, with startups, with a vision for a country, then it can become very inclusive. And then you put your chief ministers in competition in a fun way, regardless of political party. Which you started, and, by the way. Yes, yeah, yeah. and uh, you, you, you let them sort through it. So I think the country's headed in the right way. I like a healthy give and take in terms of the overall approach to, to politics that go with it. This is, this is a very important consideration for India. For India to develop, the rural India and the rural economy has to develop. Yes. Because most of India lives there. And there are two reasons we need to do it. One is defensive, that if you don't, that'll go down the tube and India cannot develop. And on the flip side, if you do, and I'm saying, if you even look at it, forget the human angle, which is absolutely, absolutely critical, even if you look at it purely in economic terms, that is the single largest potential growth market in the world. Yes, it is. 68 percent of 1.3 billion people lives there. Yes. Just imagine if you can turn this around, what consumption, what market, what growth you can get would be bigger, bigger growth than you can get in Europe or in North America. So you're already going to be the fastest growing economy in the world at 7%. Yep. I think if you digitize the country and you make it inclusive, yep. double digits are within your grasp, sustainable, maybe yep. for a decade. Yep. Yes, please. Uh, hello, my name is Tanya Chen, and I'm a uh, undergraduate student at UC Berkeley. Um, you mentioned only acquiring companies with a similar culture, and we know C uh, Cisco is known for their leadership in CSR and sustainability. Uh, recently, Modi Jia in 2013 introduced the Companies Bill, which encourages CSR through philanthropy and the top companies in India. Uh, how else can we establish CSR in India, not only with startups, but SMEs as well, and implement you know, as, uh, CSR and sustainability in the long run, and what are the potential benefits for CSR in India, and where is that intersection between politics and CSR? Simple question, it'll take me about one sentence. <laughs> a little bit of humor. Uh, it's the right questions to be asking. Uh, and Sunil and I actually had this conversation backstage about it's so important that those companies and groups in India that are successful give back and do it on a larger scale yeah. 
more consistent. Your company's always done it, but you're the exception, and it needs to be more of a general rule. The second issue is, uh, and this is a little bit controversial, I think our generation did not do as good a job as we needed to in this area, especially on inclusion of gender uh, and uh, individual groups. I think the millennials will solve this. And that's where all the job creation is going to occur, small business, startups, and growing. And the one company, Unifor, that I am uh, uh, public about that I've invested in, and, and a brilliant young CEO in a mesh, and he's, he is really good. He started a program about uh, a year and a half ago after we'd gone back and forth on issues of just requiring one female to be interviewed for every job opening. He didn't mm. give out any quotas, didn't do anything else. Wonderful. And he went from 24% gender diverse to 34% in, in 14 months. So I think the millennials is where you crack this issue, both on corporate social responsibility, yeah. but especially on inclusion, and that's where the jobs are going to be. Fantastic. So I'll, I'll just take a minute on this. I'm, I'm sorry, no more. We, we have to wind up now. Uh, we won't take any more questions, but I will respond to this. Uh, so while we were doing uh, things ourselves, John, um, and also some of our, I have to say, many of our friends in industry were doing it, mm -hmm. but it was considered a very Indian thing not to talk about it. So on behalf of Indian industry, actually I was the president of CII in that year. Yes. So I stood up on behalf of all of industry and told the government this is not okay. You should not pass legislation which forces company, uh, and many of them will be tempted to fudge their numbers and fudge their books. Or they might write things they're already doing as training, employee benefits as, as CSR. But I have to admit I was completely wrong. There is absolutely fantastic work going on right now. Uh, for the girl child, for the disadvantaged, for uh, uh, access to villages, for clean drinking water. There is some amazing work that companies are doing, not all of them, but many of them are doing a fantastic job. Uh, and I think it's been a very good move for India as a nation, but you're right, we do need, more of us need to do more of this. But it's and, the same comment about dyslexic. Yep. Why do I talk about it? Yep. Because people see that you can overcome it. Uh, if you talk about it being an important part of your vision yeah. and others are examples and yeah. you're very profitable, they see why that occurs too. So I actually did have Madeleine Olson from the United Nations come and twist my arm. She said, you must talk about this. I'm sorry we don't. This okay. culturally, in India, it's considered bad to talk about yourself and things you do uh, because you give anonymously. You don't publicize it. And, and uh, she said, no, for the very same reason. She said, you need to talk about it because not enough people are doing it. Others who look at, at these entities and these people as examples need to see that this is a good thing to do. And it pays back, I mean, you cannot even calculate the goodwill that you generate, it's immeasurable. It's okay. absolutely amazing impact. So I had promised Rekha yesterday that this would be the best session in the entire conference. I told Salman this will be a great conference and this will be the best session. And I, I think I was absolutely right. Would you guys agree with me? <laughs> so, I, I, want, I want you to leave us with one more. <laughs> so that's the advantage of having somebody like John here. So I want you to leave us with one comment. Solomon, you need to give sure. me half a minute more. So just in your mind, a lesson, because it's difficult to get access to people like yourselves. It's not easy, because I also see some students here, and I see entrepreneurs here, I see professional managers, I see academics. It's a wonderfully diverse group here uh, who has interest on the relationship between India and the US. And you are uh, uniquely positioned at this juncture right now to, to address this. So if there's one lesson that you would want to leave behind uh, for the audience of mistakes that we might make that we should avoid, or something that you should do, either one, I'll leave that for you. I think you need to do what I need to do as well. I think you need to dream bigger. And about the time you think you're getting uncomfortable, that you're dreaming too big, I want you to dream bigger than that. Uh, the way you lead is to have the courage of your dreams. And my regret is I need to dream even larger. So that would be my one takeaway. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. And thank, thank you for this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate this.